Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Amy Kokenauer Betancourt. I am the CEO of Cadasta Foundation. We are a nonprofit organization working globally to advance land and resource rights. So Greg did uh, me a favor and talked a little bit this morning about what a circular economy actually is. But I just want to say <clears throat> there are a lot of definitions out there and just for simplicity purposes, um, the way I understand it is that a, a circular economy creates economic, social, and natural capital by doing these three things, designing out waste and pollution, keeping products and materials in use, and then regenerating natural systems. And it's this last one that I really want to talk about in the context of land rights. Um, there's also the conversation about a circular bioeconomy, which is essentially replacing industrial sources for producing food materials and energy with biological resources. And I'm not really going to get into that. What I really want to focus on is what is the purpose of these economies, whether it's bioeconomy or a circular economy? Well, the purpose is economic prosperity, environmental quality, and human well-being. And I think in the human well-being part of it, it's about um, a sustainable well-being and inclusive well-being. So the problem that we deal with at Cadasta Foundation and our reason for being is that there are one billion tenure insecure people globally. And there's a statistic out there from the World Bank that says that 70% of land in emergency economies is unregistered, that the people who live on that land do not have any kind of formal legal claims or titles uh, uh, from the government to that land. And the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has specifically put out a report saying that this state of insecure land tenure affects the ability of people to make changes to land that advance adaptation and mitigation for climate change. So this is really a fundamental issue around regenerative or regenerating natural systems is that if the people living on the land who are there as guardians and stewards of the land um, who can effectively put in place adaptive and mitigating approaches, if, if, if they do not have legal rights to that land, then um, there's no real chance of having the kind of climate adaptation mitigation at scale that we need. And so really there's no circular economy or bioeconomy without the sustainable and equitable use of land and natural resources. And there's a real disconnect then between the idea of regenerative natural systems and the fact that land and resource rights are not, are not secure for the, for the majority of people and, and land in emerging economies. So really, we find ourselves in a global land crisis. We see growing evictions and displacement, deforestation, pollution, land grabs. Um, obviously loss of habitat and biodiversity, but also livelihoods, history, and culture, particularly within indigenous lands and communities. And then, of course, gender inequality and, and unregistered rights. So if we want to talk about a circular economy and we want to talk about the natural systems aspect of it, we must talk about land and resource rights and we must talk about how we're going to formalize that at scale. And of course, land tenure security underpins the success of most of the SDGs and these elements of conservation, sustainable land use, et cetera. <clears throat> and <clears throat> what I just find amazing um, is that within the SDGs, if you break them down, there are five SDGs that really specifically relate to land, land tenure, but really there are 13 of the SDGs that relate some way or another to land. 59 targets and 65 indicators. And so there, we cannot achieve the SDGs uh, locally or globally without addressing the issue of land, land tenure rights, and um, the issue of the relationship between people and land. Cadasta is the world's leading global land technology and services platform. It's a big statement, but um, we, we, uh, we, we claim it and, and we hope to continue uh, along, that, along those lines. But we focus on empowering vulnerable communities to affordably and easily document, map, and secure inclusive land and resource rights. And our, our, our purpose is to have a more sustainable and equitable planet. So, um, 
we work with a lot of different partners and donors to make this happen. This is just a small list. We work with a lot of the bilaterals, some of the multilaterals, some of the, the land mapping agencies that do international work like Land Materiet in Sweden and Cadaster International here in the Netherlands. Um, and we're also starting to do more and more work with um, conservation and climate organizations like Conservation International and others um, who are really starting to understand that if they want to preserve biodiversity and forests and wildlife, they need to focus on the issue of land and resource rights for people. So by focusing on this area, CADASTA is empowering communities to improve forest and land conservation, to improve access rights and opportunities for women, youth, and indigenous communities, but also to spur sustainable food, energy, and resource systems, including as part of a circular economy, and also more transparently in governance. Um, so we really, uh, CADASTA brings technology tools and training to do this mapping and documentation to these different stakeholders. Um, and we really focus on the idea of local empowerment, empowering local organizations, NGOs, communities, indigenous groups, et cetera, as well as local governments to uh, map and document uh, both individual and community rights and to use that information and use that data to not only advance tenure but also to solve other problems in their communities. We work in cities, farms, and forests um, and our cross-cutting areas are women's empowerment and equality, sus climate sustainability and youth development. And I think what CADASTA uniquely brings together, which is a bit unusual, is this focus on land administration. We have land administration experts, technology and the appropriate use of technology in a local context, and then sort of sustainable, sustainable community development expertise. We bring that all together in one agency and we focus on supporting the groups who are working on the ground in this space. Um, this is our dashboard globally. We, um, we are only, um, we're in the sixth year of operation. We were created in 2015, so we're a very young organization. But in that time, we have almost five and a half million people mapped on our platform. We work with 85 partners globally in 38 countries. Um, that includes about almost uh, over 19 and a half million hectares of land and 2,000 communities. And the data on our platform of those people, uh, people whose rights are mapped, 53% of those are women, which is a, which is a big deal. Um, because of the issue of women's land rights and how critical that is and how difficult that is. Um, and we offer a range of tools, technology, and services. And um, we are an ESRI-based platform. And we find that the tech, while the technology is critical to it, it's only really a small piece. We have to provide um, technical assistance, training, and, and, and support to ultimately turn this over and enable these uh, local partners to do what they do best. So I just wanted to give one example of this to kind of show you what it looks like on the ground. Um, again, we work with 85 uh, different partners who have data on the platform. Um, it very clearly want to state that the data is not owned by Cadasta. It is owned by our partners in the local community, so that's important to say. Um, but we, this example is in India, in two states, Odisha and Jharkhand, and it has to do with the Indian Forest Rights Act, which is passed by the government in 2006, but um, under which very little land has actually been formalized and very few rights have been issued. Um, and so what we did is we focused on bringing technology to a local organization called Pradhan. Um, and actually we have 25 partners in India that we work with, but this is just one of the examples. So far they've mapped um, over 300,000 hectares and have um, uh, captured the rights of 8,700 uh, individuals, but that continues to grow as they expand out their work. So this is just an example of some of the base, base layers. What's important here, you know, it captures village boundaries, cadastral maps as base maps, uh, revenue maps, and then village boundaries. So um, I said that already, uh, but the important thing is that it needs to follow a bureaucratic government process of verification, 
from the very local governance body, the panchayat, all the way through the revenue office, the forest office. So this is just one of the maps. And then the survey tool um, is a data collection tool that's used locally. We, uh, the Pradhan gauges community mappers. In fact, this is a photo of them. Um, mapping and we make sure to engage women and youth in this process but it's about uh, both individual and community forest rights there are two different processes for that um, this shows a, a stage a different stages of mapping it lists the district the village which is the panchayat which is the government body and as well as the in, uh, information on the claimant and then the, of course the geospatial information uh, Pradhan has used this data to put out these individual forest rights maps for the first time. They've never had these kind of, this kind of data collection or this kind of um, mapping and, and outputs done before, uh, as well as community forest resources. And then this is their dashboard. And you can see on here gender ownership, uh, total parcels, total individuals, total hectares, land use types, what type is it, you know, cultivation, homestead, et cetera. Uh, percentage of revenue to non-revenue forest and then other other types of information this is just one of the screens but this was Pradhan's uh, they actually created this slide because they were doing a presentation to share out how, how how it's worked for them and this is what they said that it's easy to understand by community users and I'm talking about community mappers um, both there's both on and offline data collection which is important the communities are very excited to see and the maps printed out and to verify their land on site that's that engages them in a, in a new way and it also supports the m and &E and, and and reporting out through dashboards and is easy and transparent uh, and effective for cost effective to replicate and then finally, just a, a bit about the, 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 the impact. A lot of what I shared with you is outcome, output data. Um, but we did an, a third party evaluation of this work. And I'll just want to point out two, two things that came out. One was on the perception of tenure security, which is an important indicator around behaviors around conservation, investment in land, soil, and all of that. Before mapping, 75% of the community landowners were very worried or slightly worried about losing their property. After the process, after documentation, 74% of the respondents report that their worry has decreased. So we're seeing that impact in terms of community uh, perception. And then finally, the quality of life, 83% of respondents at the beginning report, uh, or at the end, reported an improved quality of life due to this, to Cadasta and this project. And of course, Pradhan was very much a part of that. And then the data collector piece on the, on the right-hand corner is um, we had two separate evaluations, one with landowners and one with data collectors. And 95% and of the data collectors reported not having access to a good alternative to Cadasta's platform, suggesting that we're filling a very large market gap. And indeed, um, we are starting now to see all of the partners that we're working with in India, where people are starting to claim and get these, these forest rights uh, for the first time. And um, that has go is going to have significant impact on livelihoods and conservation. And again, going back to um, the circular economy then, that this geospatial technology has a very marked um, uh, impact on the ability to secure land rights in the context in which we work globally, which is critical for regenerative natural resources, which is part and foundation of, of, a, of a sustainable circular economy and leads to these things that we want it to, which is prosperity, environmental quality, and uh, human well-being. So my final bit here is a bit of an appeal uh, to the room, which is we have an incredibly ambitious vision for 2040, which some may say is audacious and a little bit crazy. But, you know, hey, we're putting it out there that we want to catalyze land systems change globally, leading to inclusive land and resource rights for half of these 
one billion tenure insecure people. So in order to do that, we need to come together with a lot of different partners and networks uh, for funding, expertise, communications channels, influence and partnerships. And so this is an appeal uh, to all of you to try to join us in, in, in this endeavor globally to map 500 million people and secure their rights. Uh, globally. So please join us and please get in touch with me to have that conversation. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, that was really excellent, wasn't it? There's nothing better than actually recording land rights and then being able to allocate that to the correct person and then that may be mutually agreed and then you can move forward with all the other things that we want to do based on that data set. So it's fantastic work by Amy and, and her colleagues. Um, our next presentation is... Ah, we have a question for Amy, if you wouldn't mind. Coming back to the stand, yeah. Sorry, I just forgot to ask. <laughs> so I loved it, it was great. Ah, um, how do you capture the data using drones or in some other way? So we work in, with local context in whatever the data, mo we help um, establish that data model and how data comes into the platform is very much dependent on our partner and what is, uh, needed in terms of outcomes, but also what is available. We've worked with drone imagery, um, you know, we've brought in existing data from data that's been collected through other sources, um, and we, we have also run GNSS cables and, um, and, and linked it to the, to the smartphones and the tablets to also improve accuracy. So it's, it's done in a variety of ways, and it's always based on the local context and what our partners need. Uh, are there any other questions? Now that I'm up here? Oh, okay, sure. Hello, thank you very much for your presentation. It was really enlightening and also encouraging for grassroots communities to, to build up together on, on, on this endeavor to, to find, you know, a certain circularity in the economy. And my question is exactly about that. How do you find a circular economy in the fact that you start by registering something that will be otherwise very expensive to do because of the many investments from the government and probably the slack and stuff like that and that this creates in a way a wealth for the people and also as you showed inclus inclusivity how, how do you feel this is related to circularity that is to say it creates the value from out of nothing or at least out of a register? Well, when we're talking about, for example, sustainable food systems, or we're talking about um, any kind of production, whether it's energy, food, or, or, um, or uh, materials, is, you know, we've got to start with the foundation of who these producers are, where, the, where these elements are coming from, and, and, you know, the relationship between people and their land is foundational to a circular economy when we're talking about, the, about accessing natural resources for that production. So, I, to me, it's kind of, it, to, to me, it's just kind of foundational, and I think we talk a lot at the macro level about this. We talk about individual behavior in our homes, about reducing waste and reusing things, but when it comes to the natural systems and the natural resources aspect of it, um, you know, again, there's a lot of, there's a lot of talk about you know, for example, the carbon credit market um, using LIDAR, radar. I think we're going to hear a little bit more about that, you know, to measure carbon stock and forests and things. Well, that's great, and I always raise the question, okay, if we're, if we're sort of monetizing these resources and how are we ensuring that the legitimate landowners are, are, are taken into consideration when we're building out these kinds of uh, local ecos, you know, economies and, and um, ecosystem services and things like that. So I don't know if I answered your question, but to me it's just kind of foundational and it often gets left off the table. It's not a conversation that's happening enough. And I think it's starting out there, oh, indigenous communities' rights are critical to the achievement of, you know, our climate change goals, our climate action goals, but yet 
they, the, the, the formalization of those communities is extremely low. And so what are we doing about it? So to me, the, the, the idea of a circular economy um, isn't kind of a side issue. It's kind of really foundational to, to the idea and, and very in line with indigenous thinking and traditional customs. That, that, that their whole mindset and culture is based on circular, the ideas of, of a circular, not just economy, but a circular, uh, you know, existence, so to speak. Just set it all. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Of course. So, um, I would be interested to see, uh, hear your opinion on uh, when you have gone to do cadastra in certain in places where it is then become um, uh, clear that it is common ground or mutual ground or belongs to a tribe rather than one or two people yeah. or a family. Yeah. So there's this big debate out there about individual versus communal community rights. And, and we, you know, Cadasta is an honest broker, if you will, in the sense that we don't ever try to adjudicate that. What we're doing is trying to support processes on the ground that are already underway that are being led by local stakeholders. So in the case of this India project I mentioned, there's both an individual forest right piece and a commu community forest right. That's, a, that's codified in the law, there are processes and systems, we're simply supporting that process. But in general, I think that um, it really depends on what the objective of the uh, project is who and, and um, who the stakeholders are and what they're trying to get to. And, we, um, we support all of that, right? We support all of that and um, don't try to take a stance on whether it should be one or the other because there are benefit, there are pros and cons to both of that. But I think the key is that communities not be disenfranchised, whether they're communities as a whole or whether they are, indiv or are individuals. I'll say one more thing. Even if there's legal demarcation or delimitation of community land that has actually been recognized by the government, what we're finding is inside that space, communities need tools. They need their own data. They need to manage and collect and, and use their own data for their own purposes inside the, the community land. So there's, there's also an application of this even when the community land has been recognized. There's a lot of need for data around forest uh, rights management, uh, natural resources management, and other things that communities are doing inside their land. Okay. So, thank you. Karen.